I think there are a lot of challenges that we still face. I think, you know, Obamacare is not just about enrollment on the exchanges, although it is one of the central pieces of it. And I think the other pieces are operating very, very well. We have an enormous number of uh, young adults, 26 and under, that are now in, enrolled that otherwise weren't. We have almost 10 million people in the Medicaid program that weren't otherwise in. So we've done very well, and the uninsured rate is dramatically lower than it was prior to the implementation of the ACA or Obamacare. But I do think the exchanges have real challenges in them. You know, about 80, 85 percent of the people on the exchanges receive subsidies. So the rates that we're seeing going up on the exchanges are actually um, not the real rates that consumers are seeing. In many cases, it is the cost that will be um, passed on to the federal government. So it may mean that some of the costs are going up faster than we thought, although the overall budget for the ACA has come in lower than originally expected. Um, but I do think there are issues around adverse selection on the exchanges that we worried about at the beginning and that are somewhat uh, becoming more clear right now. And I think there are ways that can that can fix it as well going forward. But with the partisanship that exists right now in Congress um, and during this election season, those solutions are a little bit off. I don't think that we're in, in any imminent danger of complete implosion, but there are very real challenges um, that we face at this time. Politically, I think what we just witnessed with Aetna pulling out is even a more specific case because Aetna just a few months before pulling out said that they looked at this as the investment period. They were willing to have some losses because that's what it costs in order to look at a new book of business. And then suddenly, spontaneously, when the federal government decided not to approve the merger that they were looking for, uh, all of a sudden they decided to pull out of the exchanges. And one wonders whether some of that move was really a political response rather than just a, a um, economic and business response. It doesn't make sense to me for that to be the case, only because the antitrust division of the Department of Justice doesn't really run the Affordable Care Act, uh, first of all. And then secondly, you know, if you're an insurer and if the insurers were to decide that they didn't like the Affordable Care Act as it's currently structured and were going to pull out, I think the next most popular solution uh, would be the so-called public option, would be to expand Medicare essentially uh, and go down to say 55 or to everybody. And if Medicare is expanded, then insurers don't have uh, anything to do. I mean, Medicare is a public program. So if the insurers want Obamacare to stay in the current form of a privatized benefit run by private sector insurers, and that's business for them, then they have to work with the government to find a way to make it, to make it function, um, not pull out. Now, I think part of the issue is that the um, people enrolling in the, uh, through the exchanges are more similar to Medicaid beneficiaries. They're lower income and they're quite sick. As Howie said, we've had adverse selection into the exchanges, so more sick people are signing up than healthy people. And when the sick people sign up and they're getting a subsidy, these are enrollees who are a little more similar to the Medicaid population than the commercially insured population. And so I think the insurance companies are coming to terms with that. You know, there needs to be uh, budgeting for that kind of sickness level. There needs to be um, you know, designing networks and benefit design for that group. And I'm not sure that uh, we all appreciated that that's what was going to happen because we thought, well, there are these penalties, and so everybody will sign up. And the penalties are not high enough yet to make everybody sign up. Um, so we still have some, some folks who are uninsured kind of on purpose, um, and that's making the pool a little sicker than it would otherwise be. By the time of the second sign-up period, Nobody had even experienced the penalties yet. I mean, in many cases, even people that should have had penalties assigned to them weren't paying them. So it, there is a lag as well. It takes a while until you get people to think, you know, I just filed my taxes and now I have a penalty that I have to pay, a mandate tax that I have to pay. Um, so now next year I have to go ahead and sign up. And I think it's going to take a while to get that. But having said that, the, pen, the mandate tax is too small. Everybody knew it was too small at the beginning. And we also know from you know, a, a reasonably vast literature over time that <coughs> mandates are never 100% effective. They don't come close to 100% effective. If you look at mandates to wear helmets, if you look at mandates to have car insurance, uh, they're, they're woefully inadequate um, unless you have really severe penalties assigned to them. 
And so I think this is going to be one of the big tasks for the next Congress is to decide, do they want to make this work? If they want to make this work, they can. They can raise the penalties either financially or, or in terms of implementation and make it work. If they want to see this fail, then they're doing a good job because what they're doing is basically through obstruction, preventing it from succeeding. And this is really one well, of the big challenges. Well, what you're doing is really freezing the original legislation in place. And that right. original le legislation wasn't quite perfect, as one would imagine. So, for example, the subsidies for the sick people are not, I think, quite high enough. And they're I mean, we need to find a way to make insurers happy to participate in a marketplace, no matter how sick the people are. And that's currently not true, so you need to, to tweak the legislation to make that true, but that would require Congress to do that. And as Howie said, Congress would have to want this to succeed rather than want it to fail. Um, I, d I don't think it's failing, actually. I think it's, it's going to trundle along, but it's not going to uh, enroll more people and be as efficient as possible um, without some improvements. It is without historic precedent, as far as I could tell, for a, a bill of this size, a piece of legislation of this size, not to have had substantial follow-on legislation. And the reason for that is that it was passed with a pure Democrat um, you know, constituency. So the Republicans have really not wanted to touch it. And even the Democrats don't want to open it up for discussion because now that the Republicans have a majority in, in both houses, um, they have concerns of what could be undone at that point. So it is a very unfortunate political situation that we're in right now. Um, and I, I agree, it is not failing. I want to make clear I agree with you on that. But boy, it could thrive. This could be something that could be refined and be something that would be a real source of pride for both parties.